we'll start the uh, science program here with uh, uh, Charles Clark. Where's Charles? Ah, uh, here is Charles. Okay, so uh, Charles Clark and myself, we know each other for I, I can't count the years. It's uh, maybe 10 or 20 years even. Introduced by Charles' uh, brother. And the first time we met was at dinner here in, in Tokyo. And uh, Charles Clark worked many years uh, and is still working, I guess, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is a very, very large US government, uh, mainly standards organization, but linked to that also, they have a huge uh, research program. It's one of the most important science, uh, global science centers. Of course, focus to, to uh, standardization, but not only this. So NIST uh, does um, uh, leading work in, in cryptography and therefore also, of course, in quantum, quantum uh, computing and many, many other quantum optics and many, many other areas. And I had uh, Charles uh, very kindly invited me to his institute uh, in, in north of Washington. And so he showed me also his laboratories and I can tell you they are some of the finest in the world. So. Uh, but Charles is now in Oxford, and okay, I'll give the word to Charles. Oh, okay. Thank you so much, Gerhard. Now let me uh, let me see if I can share the screen. Yes, I just wanted to mention on a personal note. Uh, I sent this photograph to. Um, Gerhard, just a few days ago, I found it in my records. This shows uh, I'm on standing on the left here. On the right is a man who, a uh, great man, Muhammad Arif, who really uh, took me under his wing and um, gave me a career in neutron physics late in life. I became a sexuagenarian postdoc under his, uh, under his guidance. Sadly, he died a few years ago. And in between us is Ludwig Boltzmann. Uh, Arif and I were on a business trip to Vienna, Austria, actually to talk to people in neutron research there at the Atom Institute in Vienna. And um, on the weekend, we, we took a visit to the Central Cemetery, uh, Vienna, and visited Boltzmann's grave. Oh, before you switch off, can you go back to Boltzmann's grave? Yes. Comment yes. a little bit on the grave. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. If you look at the grave in the middle, you won't be able to read the inscriptions. But on the right hand side of the grave, you will see three people written engraved in the stone, and uh, these are my uh, grandfather, so the Boltzmann's son, and his wife, my grandmother, and also my mother's. A brother who unfortunately died in the Second World War, and my mother will is also engraved there now, unfortunately because she died. And uh, her name, I, I I don't know if her name is already on there, but if it's not yet, it will soon be also in 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 uh, in inscribed there in the stone. And on the top, you can see this entropy s equal k times logarithm of uh, w of of. Um, yes, there there are many better pictures of this gravestone on the internet. I encourage all of you to uh, <laughs> find them. Uh, actually, I, I just, uh, you mentioned your mother's brother. His, his um, memorial there is particularly haunting because it, it gives a clue as to the manner of his death. I believe he was killed in battle. Yes. In the Battle well, of Smolensk. Yes. Uh, you know, a, a, a name of fell memory to those who remember the Second World War. Yes, it's he was. Uh, I, I forgot the age, but he was forced to be a soldier at the age of seventeen or so. And he came. My mother, of course, knew him, and she. He was kind of coming back, uh, you know, on on how do you say on like short holidays or rest times. And he told my mother that he will not come back the next time. And he said that he hasn't. He sees no way to survive this. So that is very sad, and it hasn't. It's not stopping. You know, it's still going on. This type of wars today. Yes, indeed, it's awful today. Well, if 
if we can switch to a uh, happier note, yes. uh, I'm pleased to be able to tell you about recent work done, uh, very much an international effort. Indeed, I'm um, a resident now, I'm, I'm uh, I, my sabbatical term in Oxford and tomorrow, uh, sorry, on Wednesday, I'll be visiting the ISIS muon and neutron source which is a source of neutrons for research located here in Oxfordshire, uh, one of the main such uh, facilities in the world. I'm associated with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which has a uh, research reactor that's the source of the, uh, the neutrons that are used in the work that I'll describe here. And the, the main theme of my work is the coming together of a technique that was established in optics, in the you know the use of in light, uh, in the mid nineteen nineties, and it's become a major area of research, and its techniques have propagated into other fields of science, and I'll review that, and then uh, tell you a bit about our uh, work on neutrons. So this is very nearly the exact 50th anniversary of a foundational paper. It has a, this title seems a bit specialized, Dislocations and Wave Trains. It was a collaboration uh, by Nye and Mary, Barry. Uh, Barry is Sir Michael Barry, Professor Sir Michael Barry, FRS, who, um, best known for the Barry phase, a very influential scientist uh, in modern physics and mathematical physics. In this paper, Nye was a glaciologist and he'd been observing radio wave reflections. Radio waves are sent through glaciers and then the reflected waves are used to try to understand the conditions of the Earth's surface under the glacier. And Nye observed this peculiar phase dislocation in the analysis of these radar signals. So they wrote a paper together. And it um, this shows the citations of that paper per year from the web of science. This is for, for those of you who aren't always looking at your own personal citation, citation index every day, like I am. Uh, uh, the, the metric of of, of scientific uh, relevance of work is is obtained by counting the number of times that it's been cited by other papers. So if it's cited a lot, that means that other scientists are paying sufficient attention to it that they record it as a precedent in their own report of their research. So uh, this is sort of like the batting average for a baseball player. And as you can see, this, uh, this paper for about 20 years went along with very few citations. Looks like a lot of my papers in that respect. And then uh, all of a sudden in uh, about 20 years after its publication, it took off and is now the second most cited paper of Michael Berry. Well, what happened? in the, uh, what triggered that sudden recognition of its relevance. And this happened uh, not in the Ukraine. Second time I've mentioned the Ukraine in my presentation, a group of Marat Soskin who died two years ago, very distinguished uh, founder of a school of optics that was located in the Institute of Physics at the Academy of Sciences of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, now uh, Kiev, Ukraine. And here's the title of that famous paper. Uh, it's published in the letters of the Journal of Experimental and Theoretical Physics, uh, the, the main Soviet uh, journal of physics. And this is the letter sections or for, for priority publications. And this is uh, what I'm showing you is the English translation of that paper. The original was published in Russian. Uh, here's the location of the work. Kiev now, uh, capital of Ukraine. 
And the, the work of Soskin's group proceeded from a very simple experiment, uh, which is the diagram of which is in the upper left of this slide. So the unit one is a laser beam going through an expanding lens labeled by two. And then here, uh, it, it, this, this beam is being entered into a configuration, very famous interfer interferometric configuration, uh, the mach zander uh, configuration, which was invented simultaneously by Ludwig Mach, who was an uh, Austrian uh, physicist, son of Ernst Mach, I believe, and uh, Ludwig Zander, a uh, German. Uh, this is this is this configuration is used uh, throughout optics. It's actually used. You make unknown use of it almost every day when you place a call on your mobile phone. Uh, Mach Zander interferometers are used for multiplexing of uh, telecommunication signals. In any event, the the operation of the, the, the interferometers, the beam enters this apparatus three, which is a beam splitter. And then uh, half the beam is sent down, it, it proceeds to, let's see, I think it's uh, unit four. Uh, so it's somewhat blocked on my screen. Let me get out of the, uh, yes, uh, which is a mirror uh, sent down through a beam expander uh, to, a, to another mirror. Uh, uh, half mirror that's that reflects the that beam onto the receiving screen, and then the so-called that's the reference beam using the language of holography. The object beam is the other part of the beam that's then split off by the beam splitter three. It's uh, reflected off a mirror and focused into a braid of optical fiber, and then the object beam and the reference beam. Uh, are set out to a, a spatially resolving detector or photographic film, and you see the interferogram of those two. So this is this is basically a very standard um, implementation of holography, but using the um, the interferogram reflects the, the properties of the original reference beam expanded to be a spherical wave and the object emit passes through this braid of fiber. So now, if the fiber braid were just transmitting the light uh, as, if, as if it were pure glass, then you would see an interference pattern, famous um, structure called Newton's rings, that is the interference of a plane wave with a spherical wave. Now, let me get back on full screen. And what uh, the Soskin group did was to twist this braid, just twist the braid with their hands. It's like a, it's like a, a, a set of spaghetti strands. You're holding your hands. You might give them a gentle twist. And when they did that, they obtained the figure that you see here, figure B on the left of this Newton's rings figure. I've, the Newton's ring figure comes from a famous uh, textbook by uh, Robert Williams Wood. I've scaled it to match the image that was reported and that was shown in the, the Softon paper. And you see these, these two images look very different look very similar on the periphery. They look like the same image. But when you look up close, you see that for the Newton's rings, you have an island of black in an island of white. In another island, you have this concentric nest of alternating black and white disks. But with this twist, you see there's now one continuous black spiral in the whole figure. So unlike the Newton's rings, where these, these are disconnected regions, there are now just two regions, one of destructive interference and one of constructive interference, a nested spiral. 
So somehow the complete topology of the interferogram has been changed just by a simple twist of the brain. And in their paper, a uh, group of Soskin report a form of hologram that could be constructed to, to create the form of light that is responsible for uh, this phenomenon. That 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 work was that work was quickly taken up by others. And what's what's going on? The fundamental optical manifestation that's being realized there is a form of the twisting of light waves. So, in ordinary light, as we use it, and as as we, as has been used in the history of optics from the Greeks up to the present day, uh, the way we now understand light uh, due originally to the work of Thomas Young in the early 19th century is as a motion of a wave. Well, when quantum mechanics comes in, then, then that picture is actually, um, uh, there's another level of detail there, and I'd say not in essential detail. The basic uh concept of light as a wave uh is is accurate and just it's the, the wave motion is quantized with quantum mechanics and the, the the form that we use in virtually every application is where the the wave fronts are are planar so in other words you have a a light signal where there's an intensity that that varies sinusoidally as a as a as, the, as you move along the axis of wave propagation, but the wave fronts are, are planes. And this, this, this is the same in ordinary sound. If you're, you're hearing me speak now, my voice has created a wave disturbance in the density of air, which is propagated in the microphone on my uh, laptop. And it's coming out either your earphones or the speakers on your laptop. And it it looks though that wave motion looks like something has basically a plane or spherical wave front. No the the disturbance of the air is oscillating back and forth, and it forms a reg the, the oscillations can be seen as a, as the variations of the planar surface. But in the theory of wave, basic theory of wave motion, it's easy to construct, construct solutions in which the, the wave varies as you go around the axis of the propagation. So you get sort of a, a screw-like motion, a helical motion. And um, this, was, this was known for a very long time, but it was only first implemented about 30 years ago that you can actually uh, control, you can, create emitters that realize this spiral motion and you can you can create detectors that are sensitive to it and the, the, all this is very well known in a formal sense from these uh, solution the wave equation but its implementation in practice is something rather recent i just mentioned a few highlights here in light ultra cold atoms electrons neutrons and neutral atoms this has become a major field of investigation within optics. Here's a, uh, an image from a, a review article showing the various types of uh, development in that field that have occurred since the 1990s up to this is a, maybe a three-year-old uh, review and just um, published, uh, well, about a month ago, there's a, a huge uh, new review, 110 pages with, in their words, many figures by a number of the uh, principals in this field. Uh, these three, Saranac, Corey, Bush, Bush, and are my collaborators, co-authors of this paper at the University of Waterloo. So this is a this is a rapidly expanding area of optical science. And um, here's, for example, um, 
uh, something published earlier this month in Physical Review Letters with a prospective use of this orbital angular OAM, orbital angular momentum uh, twisted wave form of wave motion as a uh, as a perspective form of holography in applications. Now, how how so this field has evolved first from the ability to produce these twisted forms of light, and secondly, how do you detect them? So in the production, uh, there are a variety of techniques that are used. Uh, one is to use a, uh, uh, a, a, transmission, a transmission plate that is shaped like a spiral staircase. So I think you you know you're familiar with spiral staircases. Here's a here's a look down a spiral staircase. The depth of the staircase, uh, the the depth of the stairs, increases uniformly as a function of the angle of the step. So you just start from the top and you walk down, and with steps of equal size, you there's a there's a quantity of space that intervenes between the bottom of the staircase and its top. And then with the light beam coming through this, you get a phase shift in the light that emerges from this side of the beginning of the staircase with that which emerges from this side because here, from here on up, the light is traveling in air or in vacuum, which is much the same thing in optics. And here it's gone through a material medium. Another, and I would say a now more generally useful approach to that is by the use of synthetic diffraction gratings that follow the, uh, the discovery of the form by the group of Soskin. So this is a so-called forked dislocated diffraction grating. An ordinary diffraction grating, which you have on your uh, the reverse of your credit cards. You'll see this little holographic image of a bird that's brightly colored because the, the colors of light are diffracted by it at different angles by the um, grading. Ordinary grading consists of ruled lines that give very sharp interference fringes downstream. And the fork dislocation grading is, is very much the same uh, as an ordinary diffraction grating, except there's a, at one point you add an additional line or lines. And here's here's the uh, original image of Soskin and Company. Now below that is an image of such a grating. It's a photograph actually of such a grating that, that was actually manufactured by nanofabrication and used in an electron microscope. And so here the, um, you're seeing a schematic, it shows the, uh, an electron beam coming into that grating. And then the, the part of the electron beam that is diffracted in the forward direction, the so-called zeroth order beam, just has the regular uh, variation. This L is, a, is an integer that indicates the number of, of full, lines around the circle that the, the beam uh, ex executes. So the forward beam just as of the ordinary type that it, gets insensitive to the practice of the uh, presence of this fork dislocation. But then the, the two first order beams are um, have this orbital angular momentum in them one with a positive rotation, one with a negative rotation. And you see this, this is a uh, electron micrograph, a group of Ben McMorrin of the University of Oregon that shows the, the, uh, the, 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 the diffracted rotating beams with a hole in their center. It's another more recent uh, work that shows that effect in a beam of beams of atoms of helium, the lightest, uh, second lightest 
element after hydrogen and the lightest of the noble gases widely used in experimental research because of its uh, it's chemically non-reactive so that it's easy to to produce and measure intrinsic atomic physics effects uncomplicated by chemical action in uh, the noble gases and so this shows uh, uh, results of the beam of helium, helium diffracted uh, through one such grating showing the uh, characteristic uh, a hole in the center of the beam uh, and also of excited states of helium and excited states of helium are very impressive work. Uh, here's an, another um, set of electron micrographs from the Moore group that shows how very high values of angle of this transverse angular momentum can be programmed uh, can, can be programmed into a light beam. So there's now uh, on the left 200 units of angular momentum of rotational angular momentum in the um, in the first uh, in the first order the fraction being uh, so yeah this quantum angular momentum of 200 units of the reduced Planck's constant quite amazing and here's even more 800 units again this is just accomplished by uh, using electron beam lithography to manufacture these four dislocation ratings. And indeed, what's happening here, uh, I'll just emphasize, you're seeing a beam of electrons traveling through the free space and the hole is, um, the center of the hole is the axis of propagation. So these electrons, you know, the way we would describe them on the basis of ordinary experiences, they're flying through free space, but they're executing circular orbit around the axis of their general propagation. So this is not the way, well, okay, in baseball or cricket, you can throw a curve ball. And so the, uh, uh, as the ball is, is spinning, and so it can curve uh, that the effect of the spin on the air can cause the tra trajectory of the ball to curve. But here, it's as if the ball is spiraling around the line of its propagation. So it's not even like a curve ball. And it's perhaps somewhat counterintuitive to uh, think about how a particle could move like that because there are no external forces to curve its orbit in this region of um, prop free propagation. And one way uh, just to use a food, which I think is very popular in Austria and other countries, uh, I think you've all seen, uh, surely most of you have seen uncooked spaghetti strands. You may even have had a kitchen container in which the strands of spaghetti are stand up and they they splay around they sort of they make that you can see they make us they make an apparent spiral around this common core so if you think about um here here here's here's an example of that used in an artwork at fermi lab uh an apparent spiral motion that in, in fact, is a static display of, rec of rectilinear rods. Uh, here's one that's on the rooftop of the National Gallery of Art in Washington. You see the same effect, the spaghetti. So if you think of a, um, let's see, I, have, I think I have, I had another illustration, but I passed over. Uh, if, if you think about particle motion just going along straight lines. Then in the quantum picture, you could have a superposition of trajectories with a, a phase, a different phase on each trajectory. And so this, this shows that there is a, um, 
a very direct optical analogy between the ordinary rectilinear propagation of light and the spiral motion that we're able to create in it using uh, phase plates and uh, diffraction phases. Well, now the neutron. So the neutron is a particle first discovered in 1932. Uh, well, this, these slides are made for a physics audience. So I think perhaps the, uh, I'll just give a very high level uh, descriptions. It, it, this was a, this was a discovery that was, that in detail, it was completely unanticipated. The discovery of a new a particle that's a constituent of virtually every atomic nucleus. The atomic nuclei are built of neutrons and protons. The proton has an electric charge. The neutron is electrically neutral. Yet in some sense, uh, or in a very deep sense, these two very different particles are seen as different states of a common quantum system. Even though one has a charge, the other has no charge. One lives for a very long time, you know, 10 to the 20th times the uh, lifetime of the universe. The other is uh, lives only for 15 minutes. Uh, and the, the, so the, the neutron has the very special property of electrical neutrality, which gives it the ability to penetrate virtually all matter. This penetrating ability was notably exploited by Enrico Fermi. So the discoverer of the neutron, James Chadwick, discovered in 1932, received the Nobel Prize for the discovery in 1935. And then Enrico Fermi received uh, the Nobel Prize a few years later for, well, as you can see, his demonstration that the neutron could enter virtually every atomic nucleus. And by exploiting this behavior, Fermi was able to map out the nuclear properties of every element of the periodic table. And this was at a time when the only other alternative for nuclear studies was to inject other nuclear par particles into a nucleus, a proton or an alpha particle. And because of the Coulomb repulsion between the charged proton and the charged nucleus, uh, at that time, the, um, the use of protons or alpha particles to penetrate the cause nuclear reactions would require, re was restricted to um, initial proton energies of about 10 million electron volts. Accelerators could not operate, in those days could not operate at such high energies. So the neutron just completely swept the um, scene of nuclear physics in that era. Here's a chart of, the, uh, of all the, the nuclides that is the nuclei of the, of the chemical elements. And uh, you see down here, sitting all alone in this bottom corner is the neutron, the only electrically neutral uh, nucleon. Another aspect of great significance of this, uh, the existence of a, of a neutral nuclear particle, neutron, was realized by Leo Szilard. Uh, he, he conjectured that it would be possible to create a nuclear chain reaction if, to quote his own words, if we could find an element which is split by neutrons and which would emit two neutrons when we sort of one neutron. Such an element could be the vehicle for the chain reaction. He came to this conclusion while he was standing uh, at a, at a uh, waiting for a crossing walk light to change near the British Museum. With this realization, instead of publishing it, as many people would do, this was in the mid 1930s, so at which, which time you may recall was quite a bit of difficulty in Europe. Instead of publishing his uh, idea, he began work 
in secret on a British patent, uh, which was granted in March 1936 and was assigned by Szilard to the Admiral Department. That was the main sponsor of scientific research of the British military establishment. Admiralty Department is equivalent of the United States Navy. And this patent was held secret for, the, for about 13 years afterwards. It's finally published after the war. And um, Szilard uh, went to the United States uh, in the mid thirties and he became very effective proponent of the rapid exploration of nuclear energy. And uh, the US government authorized this and uh, Enrico Fermi and his team, including Szilard, built the first nuclear reactor. And we're now in the age of quantum computing. I don't know, many of you may be aware of this, the, the, the idea of a quantum computer uh, and the first important uh, application of quantum computing to factoring, finding the prime factors of large number uh, that was that the, those uh, elements were revealed in the early 1990s, and uh, we're still working on that. You know, there's we still haven't really realized a full functional quantum computer more than 30 years later, about 30 years later. The nuclear physics took 11 years to go from a basic discovery into the most powerful source of energy yet known, the implications of which we're still living with. And uh, it, again, it, um, this is all due to the fact that the nuclei can transmute elements. And so even the neutron, even the slowest type of neutron that comes out of a nuclear reactor can, can, can change the elemental composition of matter that it strikes. This makes it useful for a wide variety of applications in analytical studies, and including studies of materials. Uh, it is capable of uh, applications in material science. No other particle can accomplish. This is some recent work by my collaborators on the understanding of new magnetic structures and materials, skirmions. So the neutron has uh, wave properties, and here that those are demonstrated very vividly by this this pair of photographs taken by my colleague Daniel Hussey at NIST. Uh, these are two images of the same object. The object consists of two Asiatic lilies in a lead cask, and on the left you see that vignette photographed with a mobile phone camera from above. There's two flowers in the lead bucket. On the right, the same object. And now you're seeing uh, a neutron radiograph. So uh, behind this bucket, that is looking into the page of the image, uh, neutrons are coming from behind the image through the lead bucket. They're scattering off the flower. And then uh, the camera that produced this image is just a neutron, a spatially resolving neutron detector that's viewing, that's viewing the scene, much like you're viewing that right now, the light coming out of your laptop or your other whatever appliance you're watching this uh, presentation on. And do you see, you can see the veins inside a leaf of a flower inside a lead cask. You can see the stamens and the pistils of the flower inside the blossom inside the lead cask by the neutron contrast. So what's, what you're seeing here is, um, these, these neutrons, by the way, are all have at room temperature. So they're very low energy neutrons coming out of the reactor. And they only scatter elastically from the um, uh, from the neutrons, I see uh, Eberhard Lange is showing a, an image. Yes, those are flowers. 
Is that, are those also radiographs? Um, and what you're seeing here is basically there's a- Yeah. Yeah, Eberhard, do you like to explain what you showed us for a moment? Yeah, these are also radiographs. I just bought them in the Museum of Natural History in Oslo. <laughs> and I just thought it fits to the topic. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. So what, what's the, um, the effect that's being seen here is um, for X, if for X rays, heavy, heavy, the heavier elements have lots of electrons, and those are all absorbed by X rays. So you know, if you have a, the reason we this lead cask is here is because it stops all radiation of charged particles or electromagnetic radiation. The lead is basically transparent to neutrons, and it turns out that that hydrogen, the lightest element, has quite a larger neutron scattering cross section than does lead. So just by, so basically both the flowers and the lead cast are transparent to neutron radiation, but there's a differential in their, in their scattering cross sections. And you can exploit that to reveal structure of, of um, materials that are otherwise shielded from you by lead. Uh, here's another, uh, just one more example of that. Here's a mocha pot. I think many of you are, yes, those of you in Austria, well, I guess this is largely associated with Italy, but I'm sure many people, many of the European audience are familiar with this mocha pot. You have some water in the bottom and then there's a disc that contains ground coffee. You put this on the stove top. Well, let's just let it speak for itself. Now we're watching, again, a neutron radiograph made at the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland, where a neutron beam is, is flooding through this um, mocha pot. You see there's something going on here. There's this, here's this black in the bottom. The black is not espresso, it's just water. And water is, has, it has this high uh, scattering cross-section compared to aluminum. So you're seeing the water inside the, uh, the, the pot boiling up, being forced up through the espresso grounds to make this delicious coffee. And once again, uh, the coffee here is black, not because of the color of the espresso, but because it consists of water and is uh, strongly scattered by neutrons. Right, well, uh, enough about this. Uh, so just, a brief a brief interlude about this, the Fermi team that, that was responsible for transformation development. It consisted of a large number of um, scientists uh, displayed here. And one of them, there's only the youngest member of the team and the only woman on it is this Leona Woods, Libby, Leona Woods Marshall, as she was called at the time. And she wrote this book, the uranium people, which is a wonderful, you know, entertaining, lucid history of the project. And in this book, she um, she makes some comments about Leo Szilard, the inventor of the nuclear uh, uh, chain reaction concept. Now, Szilard is sitting, is standing next to her in this picture. She he says he's shaped like Santa Claus. I mean, I've lived in the city of Chicago. And, and Szilard is shown here, not particularly overweight by today's standards, but she, she saw him being more or less spherical. And the reason for which was he would eat as many seven sherbets for dessert many evenings at the Quadrangle Club. And another comment about his dining habits, he was served asparagus once at a dinner party. He cut off all the tops of the asparagus spears and put them on his own plate. And when asked about that, uh, he replied that he liked the tops the best. Very uh, colorful person. So uh, in the, um, I guess you, from, from the, these demonstrations that I showed, I, I think you get the sense that neutrons are highly penetrating and uh, they, they actually behave 
the the left image shows just the ordinary optical image of neutrons, light scattering from flowers, you can see. And now on the right, you see that they, they also exhibit the properties of light in revealing structure that we can perceive. And indeed, uh, neutrons do operate much like uh, they, they are governed by neutron optics in which they propagate like light through matter, but with an index of refraction, which differs from va vacuum by a part in a million versus the index of refraction of glass is 1.5, whereas the index of refraction of vacuum is one. So in contrast to normal optics, where the indices of refraction are comparable the difference between the indices of refraction from that of vacuum is comparable to one. For neutrons, it's always just about a part. And that 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 is uh, that's why we can actually make spiral phase plates uh, that uh, that that behave as ordinary optical elements for neutrons. So here's a uh, early implementation by our group that. That did a holographic recording of a so called spiral, spiral face plate milled out of aluminum. Uh, got a lot of attention, uh, widespread news attention. See, I have a question in the chat. Oh, it's not relevant. Um, the, uh, uh, so this, this spiral face plate gave hints of the um, you know, interferometric contrast of the neutron, but uh, there's a problem in that the, um, the intrinsic co coherence of neutron beams uh, is very small. Whereas with a laser, you can have a light field that's coherent over uh, an area of many square centimeters, or even larger. Uh, neutron beams remain coherent, meaning they, they retain their interference properties only over very small dimensions. So to deal with that, we have devised, um, I'll just conclude with uh, recent uh, results published this past November, where uh, our group, and this is work done by the, the uh, people at the University of Waterloo, Saranac, Henderson, and, and Halia, manufactured a um, synthetic holograph, consists of 6 million of these forked diffraction gratings following the prescription of Soskin, but tailored to neutrons. So you see an array here. So the, this is a hologram in which the, the unit cell of the hologram contains this forked diffraction uh, manufactured silicon nitride dislocation grading made by microfabrication, but then it's multiplex. So there's 6 million of these that cover the neutron beam. So now with the, the coherence like the, the, the critical dimensions of the diffraction grading are matched to the coherence like the neutron beam. And then, uh, you expect to see uh, the vortex structure of so the beam comes in and it, it, it interacts locally. Neutrons interact locally with just one of these diffraction gratings, but then when you look at the far field image, you can see the uh, the true vortex structure. So this is uh, sort of a first step towards the development of spiral motion of neutrons in a way that's well matched to exploring uh, characteristic structures of materials, helical structures of materials that occur on the atomic scale. And um, yes, it's very much a first step, but I think a, a new advance in the direction will open up the potentiality that twisted light has given for optical investigations of materials to neutrons.
And that's my message for today. Thank you. Uh, thank you so very, very much, uh, Charles. This was really fantastic. Uh, maybe I've overlooked, maybe you mentioned, but uh, on your last slide, uh, there's Anton Sly uh, uh, Zeilinger here. If you look, edited by Anton Zeilinger. Yes. And he did, before he uh, entered, uh, you know, his uh, Nobel Prize winning field, he worked on, in the 1980s or so, he worked on uh, neutron interference. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. That's a very good, uh, very good spot. And the photograph that I showed you of uh, Arif and myself at uh, Ludwig Bolson's gravesite, that was taken in a course of a visit to Vienna in which we visited uh, Zeilinger, yes. who was stationed in Vienna. And then another man I must mention, Helmut Rauch, uh, an Austrian that, physicist. He, I think that was his PhD supervisor, no? I That's think. correct. Uh, Ralph was, was he a, mentions uh, him PhD at the supervisor. beginning. And Ralph, Ralph was the, the great pioneer of neutron interferometry. So the <clears throat> classical neutron interferometer and it was shown in um, shown in uh, classic neutron interferometer, which is shown in this in this diagram. This is the Mach Zehner config, yeah, yes. with the Ludwig Zehner, also in Austria. Uh, a beam goes into a silicon crystal. Uh, part of it is transmitted, part of it is, is Bragg reflected. And then the, you get this mixing of the two paths of the beam in the neutron apparatus. And, then, and Helmut Rauch was one of the pioneers of the implementation of this very Mach Zehner type. Uh, configuration in neutrons, and that the the early uh, work of Zeilinger on the quantum properties of neutron uh, used used uh, a device in this framework. So thank you so much for that comment. Uh, yeah, he mentions very, Zeilinger very in his uh, Stockholm uh, Nobel Prize uh, talk. He gives uh, I think one hour or two hour talk I think, and at the beginning he mentions Rauch as his. Uh, you know, inspiration at the beginning of his career. Yeah. Yeah, we visited Ralph, truly a great man, fine gentleman. I think he died about two years ago, I believe, oh, at the yes. age of, in his late 80s. So, um, yeah, yeah, he must have been quite uh, old because he was supervisor. He, of he certainly left a great legacy producing a Nobel laureate, right? Oh, yeah. That's yeah. not, not every one of us can say that our student got a Nobel Prize in physics. Oh, yes, in some also, sense, it's a better tribute. It's a better tribute to have one student get a Nobel Prize and to get a Nobel Prize one's time. That's exactly so. I mean, when in, in Cambridge, for example, where I was faculty, you know, one of the kind of things people told you is uh, you have to be happy if your students are better than you are. <laughs> uh, which is not the case everywhere. You know, there are some places where the relationship is different. <laughs> Okay, so I will. I will. Uh, well, I'll. I'll. I'll stop sharing uh, after you release me. Uh, if there are any other questions, I'll be. Yeah, if there are questions, uh, Eberhard Lange, maybe. Uh, I think the people. Uh, uh, David, they works for a German optical company on strategy. There are some people here. Oliver Wright is also a physicist. So, if there are any questions here, please go ahead. Here's your chance to ask oh, questions, Oliver. Oh, yeah, uh, as you prompted i couldn't not say something so please say see you again um yeah my my field is phonons and uh there is or orbital angular momentum in uh, phonons as well oh yes as Indeed. recently demonstrated um by franco nori and co-workers i just wondered if anybody had tried scattering some uh optical um vortex beams or angular momentum beams from acoustic angular momentum beams that sounds like a double uh double oh. doubly difficult subject but that could be interesting to do brillouin scattering of uh orbital angular momentum sound waves from orbitally angular momentum um light waves yes so uh i i i think i think that's a, a great idea uh i how does, I mean, you, you need to have a, um, 
well what, what are what are the media what's what's the nature of the media in which you get natural orbital angular momentum uh phonons i think you can do it in anything mm -hmm. i just probably in in a yes i yeah with with a, with a, a fa phased array excitation of some sort so that i guess you would have to uh in in ordinary ordinary uh just without without a, uh, a a twisted drive of the phonon waves uh you know just in thermal equilibrium you just you just see the ordinary type of phonon i guess well i was thinking of you know using transducers uh as you mentioned phased array yeah well that's, then, i mean that's certainly that's a great idea yeah and um if people have got and, random... you know, and actually you know uh now that you mention it the um looking at the the phonon density of states is a very important application of neutron scattering. So uh, maybe this, maybe maybe that would be a natural vehicle for investigating chiral materials, is by looking at the interaction of uh, neutron uh, neutrons with uh, the excitation of a, a spiral phonon wave. I, uh, you've published this work. Yeah. In, in, and indeed, in the, um, I, I visited M Michael Berry just two weeks ago. I'm, I'm resident in Oxford now. I went out to Bristol for a day. I gave a version of this talk. And he pointed out to me that in the paper by Nye and Berry, there was a suggestion about that you could use a piece of cardboard to, to see. Um, these orbital angular momentum effects in ordinary sound waves, but they never they never took that seriously enough to implement it. So I think there are, there are hints in the the Nye and Berry paper that this is a phenomenon that would have a very strong manifestation in acoustics. So I will certainly look up your paper if you could possibly uh, enter the reference in the chat, or I'll just. I'll just search on your name, I guess. Uh, it's not my paper. <laughs> oh, I'm well, just... uh, but it's work of work of Franco Nori, did you say? Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, I can put it on the chat for you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Okay. okay. Any yes, uh, Oliver is. Uh, are there other questions, Eberhard, maybe, or uh, Davide works for a German optical company. May ha he may have some questions, or uh, Professor Kumoto from Kyushu, he's a mathematician. So it's uh, he may have some questions. Eberhard, do you have questions? Yeah. I mean, you're deep in optics. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm mainly now into um, uh, straight light in non-imaging optics, so not into this uh, sort of or like hardcore physics, but uh, we have, of course, contacts to um, uh, companies that make um, nano uh, structure printing, uh, 3D printing. And uh, yes. would this be suitable for get generating these gratings uh, that you used, or which kind of technology did you use? I think in the lithography, I guess, but what other materials that could be used for generating the sort of Newton. Uh, yes. So um, certainly, uh, uh, the uh, the making synthetic gratings for light uh, is a long practice, and I think the um, uh, possible areas of interest would be for um, uh, say e extreme ultraviolet lithography. So one could certainly manufacture. Uh, we use nanofabrication to manufacture optics for the EUV wavelengths. It's been done for X-rays as well, but EUV for wavelengths of um, 10 nanometers or a frac fraction of a nanometer, a few nanometers, which is a um, being widely used now. It's the most advanced, the, the form of, Semiconductor lithography uh, 
that yields the smallest critical dimensions uh, is EUV lithography using a, I think, a, typically a 13 nanometer light source. And this is this has been implemented by the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company and by Samsung that are running these uh, three to five nanometer critical dimension production lines. So there could be, um, uh, I, I said it'd be very much a research concept as to whether there'd be an advantage of using twisted uh, extreme ultraviolet nanometer wave radiation for patterning. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the answer would be, but that would be something um, where uh, an optics company would have the capability. Yeah, you know, it, it, it would require uh, patterning on the scale on the scale of um, a few nanometers, uh, but that's that you know that's uh, those are critical dimensions that are readily accessible to uh, electron beam lithography. I mean, yeah, we we we've demonstrated that um, uh, the UV lithography and uh, the manufacturer gratings. So uh, yeah, I I think that would be a um, a worthy. I, I can I can send you some review articles if you like, and it would be a worthy subject of interest in a research department of an optics company working on working on modern lithography. In my opinion. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you, Eberhard. Yeah, David. I think he has to go, but David sent me. A, maybe you've seen it. He sent a message. He also wants to come, and he worked for the German. Uh, company size, you know, optical company, but I think oh, okay, he works with I, I, I ASML apparently, but I think he has to. Oh yes, I yes yes yes. He works on okay, the on I, behalf I will, of. Uh, I I will um, well I will I will I will send to you Gerhard. I'll send a little summary response to these comments, and if you could if you could circulate it to the. Oh yeah, the I'll, I'll forward it to everybody who's here today. Everybody who registered today. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Charles. This was really, really uh, super interesting. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much for taking uh, the time and your energy for this. And also, well, your... thanks to all for coming to, to see me. And uh, so tomorrow morning, we have another session with uh, one of your friends. I think, Charles, you know her very well. Um, so if you have time, it depends on the times. Uh, uh, this week. We have tomorrow, depending on the time zones, we have oh, another session. It may, it may be later today for me. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, today and tomorrow are situationally dependent, aren't they? That's right. Uh, tomorrow, there's. Nicole, uh, I don't know how to pronounce her name, Halpern. The middle name is, I find difficult to pronounce. Younger, or uh, do you know her? Younger, yeah. I, th I think it's, I think it must be, uh, it must be come from the Germanic Junger. Ah, okay. Uh, Nicole, she very kindly also offered to talk tomorrow on her uh, favorite topic, quantum steampunk. So in Oxford, it would be uh, midnight. So if yeah. you can manage that, you are very welcome to come. Or, okay. uh, and in Germany, I think it'll be 1 a.m. So uh, if any of you is can't sleep, <laughs> you'd be very welcome to join as well to, tomorrow. Um, and But the big thing is I'm uh, working on setting up a much, organizing a much bigger Boltzmann forum uh, next year. Uh, actually, two for next year. And I may develop this platform and maybe also one in autumn. Thank you all very much. Oh, thank you for organizing this. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. Rob.